Knitting and crochet, two means of turning a string into a hat. To those of us who can't do either, they're basically interchangeable. So why then have knitting machines been successfully mass-producing textiles for hundreds of years? Well, the crochet machine is just my aunt's nickname at Craft Circle. To get why a robot can make this sweater, but not this one, let's look at how they're each made. That second sweater was crocheted by hand, meaning someone used one hook, working with one stitch at a time, to manipulate a series of loops through various holes to make a whole bunch of knots that you can now recognize as a sweater. Knitting by hand, on the other, uh, hand, involves two needles, and the person doing it works across a row of open stitches that they will attach one by one to the next row to create an interlocking set of loops, and they'll do it again and again until, ta-da, sweater. Now, unless you're one of the many HI viewers that exclusively watch in the nude, you're probably wearing a knit fabric. Sweater, socks, underwear, post-ironic dare tee, if it's kind of soft and stretchy, it's probably knit. And if you look really closely at it, you'll notice some things. First, that mustard stain never really came out, did it? And second, it's structure. You'll see horizontal lines called courses interconnected by a series of loops. Those loops are arranged in vertical lines called whales, which are a different thing than whales and also a different thing than whales, but exist anyway. The piece of clothing you've stuck your face in for the last several seconds was probably made by a machine. The first knitting machine was invented back in 1589, making it older than Calculus, Romeo and Juliet, and the far better Nomeo and Juliet. That's because automating knitting is kind of simple. A machine loops what's called the weft yarn through a row of open stitches, and every time it does, it finishes one course and starts the next. Rinse, repeat. Crochet isn't as straightforward. While knit stitches are only interlocked with those above and below them in their whale, crochet stitches are looped in top to bottom and side to side, meaning a crocheter can't just drop finished stitches. They have to keep pulling and prodding them to anchor new ones. That's easy enough for human hands, but super annoying for machiney parts. Sort of like surgery or the special secret handshake to get in my treehouse. There's also tons of variation in crochet stitches, even within a single piece. A given crochet stitch can start from any direction, pass through any part of a closed stitch, skip a stitch, double back on a stitch, put its right hand in, take its right hand out, hey Macarena. In all, according to one researcher, the basic crochet stitch involves 28 movements across 9 axes of motion. A decreased stitch somehow takes more. 42 movements. By contrast, my handshake only takes 14 movements across 6 axes and my writers still mess it up. So with all that mechanical complexity, making a machine that cranks out Harry Styles sweaters would take an economically indefensible amount of research and development, especially since knitting machines already do something similar. Plus, if you're an evil fast fashion company, you don't need crochet machines because you can just run sweatshops. Life hack. Now, maybe you've just googled crochet machine only to find that they do exist and are now feeling betrayed, or worse, mad at me. But the more you read about those machines, the more they just prove my point. Every so-called crochet machine operating at an industrial scale is actually a warp knitting machine. Warp knitting, along with being what happens to the fabric of space-time in my favorite craft-themed sci-fi romance novel, does use hooks and connects whales laterally. But it can't do the single crochet stitch, let alone any of the more complicated ones, and there's no variety in the structure. Basically, something warp knit resembles crochet the same way those candy burgers resemble a Whopper, or the way a Whopper resembles food. Technically, kind of, spiritually, no. There are also some prototypes in the world, but they're not really there yet. The most impressive has done chain, single, increase, and decrease stitches, but it can only do circular patterns, it only successfully completes a stitch on about half of its attempts, and the most stitches it's done in a row without messing up was four. You would probably put up better stats than that if you spent one afternoon learning how to crochet, which we know because one of my writers put up better stats than that after spending one afternoon learning how to crochet, and she can't even do my handshake. So yes, on a technicality, you can claim that someone's made a crochet machine, but nobody's mechanized the full variety of stitches and textures that make crochet, well, crochet. Here's a cool fact. For 100 years after mathematicians theorized the existence of hyperbolic space, which is both a math theory and the setting of that sci-fi romance novel, they couldn't figure out how to model it. Then someone came along and made a crochet piece that with its wavy, freeform shape demonstrated that you can adopt Euclid's parallel postulate to hyperbolic space. You can't knit a piece that does that, and you can't make a crochet machine that does either. And maybe that's for the best. We don't actually have to mechanize every creative human endeavor. Crochet is intended to be done by human hands. You need an intuitive feel for fiber tension, the patience to go one stitch at a time, and the ability to manipulate a hook and yarn through a wide variety of different loops and motions. Could someone one day make a machine that does all that? I don't know. 
but maybe that person should put their creative energy towards making a cool hat or something, lest Gladysbot rise up and kill us all. If you want to learn how to crochet, I can't really help you. But if you want to learn about hyperbolic space, you've got to check out our sponsor, Brilliant.org. Hyperbolic space is one of the fascinating things they cover in the course I've been taking on Infinity, along with Fractals, Cantor's Theorem, and Hilbert's Infinite Hotel. Yeah, that's right. It only took 15 minutes a day, and I'm already name-dropping Hilbert's Infinite Hotel like I own the place. But that's just how intuitive, engaging, and effective Brilliant's lessons are. You see, they know how to teach big, complex subjects. They break them down into small, much easier to grasp chunks and help you learn through straightforward explanations and interactive challenges. Not only does this make it easier to learn these big scary STEM subjects, it also makes it possible to fit learning them into a busy schedule. I'll just use Brilliant here and there for a few minutes while waiting for a meeting to start or something, and if I do that enough, eventually I'll actually understand calculus or something, which I think is so cool. So whether you're trying to grasp infinity, pass chemistry, or just figure out what in the world a neural network is, Brilliant has got you covered because they have thousands of interactive lessons that genuinely work. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, click the button on screen or head to brilliant.org slash HAI. The first 200 of you to do it will even get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription, and you'll be supporting HAI while you're at it, so sign up now.